Praise the Lord. Turn with me to the second epistle of Peter. And uh, I'm going to read the opening verses of chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. As I share with you in this uh, final session today on the appalling subtlety of false teachers, the enemies of God. Peter says, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious or damnable ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of, and through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. In our endeavor to expound something of the message of this epistle, and particularly the opening chapter, we have come to see this worthy apostle, Peter, with uh, a heart that's filled with a passion to see the Lord's people prepared for whatever may be before them, and especially to be ready in respect of the coming of the Lord. And here is Peter, of course, with his own understanding that soon he is going to receive that home call, he is going to heaven, but there are certain eventualities of which they must be made aware. And uh, he wants to see them prepared so that they may stand complete before the Father. And I feel, friends, that we must never lose sight of such an objective in God's saving purpose. Thank God that he desires to bring us as believing sinners, reconciled solely on the basis of Jesus' death, to present us, as Paul has it in Colossians chapter 1, to present us holy and unblameable and unreprovable in the Father's sight. Let us never forget that our salvation has to do with holiness. First and foremost, and for the glory of God. Not happiness, but holiness. The captain of our salvation, our blessed Lord Jesus, he is intent on leading many sons unto glory. And all oh, that we might grasp by faith the full content and intent of, of Christ's redeeming work, how marvelous to know today that we have been, by grace and through faith, freed from the guilt and power of sin, so that we might know the fullness and the newness of His life of purity and of power. And thank God for the wonderful indwelling work of the Holy Spirit now to fulfill the, the will of the Father and of the Son and bring us unto Himself in glory. I like those words of Paul in uh, uh, Galatians, rather, uh, chapter 3. Let me just uh, before refer to those words in verses 13 and 14. He says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. In order that 
the blessing of Abraham my, on the Gentiles, that blessing that Abraham himself knew through faith. It was on the basis of faith, God put righteousness to his account. And thank God, dear friends, for this marvelous not being justified by faith, just as Abraham was, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus, in order also that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Praise the Lord. So here in the letter of Peter, there are certain eventualities he is saying to the people, of which I must make you aware. In the first chapter, he says, So I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance concerning these things. Yes, even though you are acquainted with them, it's necessary to lay, those, uh, lay emphasis upon those truths again, to, to fasten them into your hearts. There is, with Peter, un uh, unquestionably, a consequence to not adding to your faith right now in the present. That's why he says, give diligence to add to your faith. No, it's not faith plus works in order we might be saved, but building on that foundation of our faith in Christ. Add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, and, and he mentions a number of spiritual graces there that are so important. In fact, he says, if you fail in this, the result will be there'll be no spiritual vision, there'll be no blessed anticipation, uh, there'll be no real motivation for you in your Christian walk. Uh, and we know, friends, what a, what a futile existence it is for one who professes to belong to Christ, and yet there is not that ongoing maturity, that, that uh, life in Christ that's uh, being more and more enriched, where we are growing in grace. That's the wonderful uh, note that, that Peter finishes his epistle on, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God help us. But also, he, he, he has in mind the consequence of not addressing what is false. Because he knows, as well as we, that a corrupt gospel is not a gospel. A corrupted gospel, friends, cannot produce true saving faith. It always leads away from Christ, not bringing men to him. As for Paul affirms that in Galatians 1 and verses 6 and 7, I marvel, he says, you are so soon removed from him who called you into the grace of Christ to another gospel, which is not another. Being removed from Christ. There's the cause and effect here. Notice in verse 2 of 2 Peter 2, it says, many shall follow the pernicious ways, the, the damnable ways of these false teachers by whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Ways that are an abomination. Peter says they are damnable, they are deadly, they are unholy ways that deserve and will reap eternal wrath. Sadly today, friends, the way of truth is despised. It is minimized. It is ridiculed. And very often, many of those who are standing for truth find themselves marginalized and criticized and condemned. But also, you notice that Peter 
he knows there is a consequence to not awaiting Christ's coming. For then, he says, one will be overtaken in such an hour and unprepared for that hallowed moment when Christ will come for his own. Or that we might be, as he describes it in chapter 3 and verse 4, of being found in peace, without spot, and blameless. In fact, let me read to you verses 11 and 12 of chapter 3. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. Let me pause there for a moment just to be reminded, friends, that this world is essentially transitory. John himself also makes mention of this in his first epistle, chapter 2, when he says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. These loves are incompatible. If you have a love for the world, you cannot have a love for God. If you have a true a devotion to God. You don't want the world. He says, love not the world, neither the things are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And the world, he says, is passing away. Not that it will someday pass away. It is passing away. Everything about this world is transitory. But he says, he that doeth the will of God abides forever. I want to be with those kind of people <laughs> who are doing the will of God. And here in 2 Peter 3, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation, that is, in all holy conduct, in that manner of life that betokens God's holiness, be ye holy for I am holy, Peter says in that first chapter, quoting from the Old Testament. All holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming day of God, wherein the, day, the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. You can appreciate the, the passion of this aged apostle who is about to be received up into heaven. And he gives space to, to, to address these eternal issues. The first of them, of course, we observed in our last session, to know the, the absolute sufficiency of the Word of God. There in chapter 1, verse 19, he talks about this more sure word of prophecy. It's described by Paul in Acts 20, and verse 32, as the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among them which are sanctified. Praise the Lord. But now, he wants us to know the appalling subtlety of the enemies of God. So he says there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false prophets among you. So whilst Peter has spoken of true prophets, he spoke of <clears throat> this sure word of prophecy having come to us through holy men who were moved, borne along by the Holy Spirit, these true prophets by whom had come the inspired scriptures, he now reminds them there are some false ones around. And so his, his message becomes one of warning primarily as he continues, even as there shall be false teachers among you. Why does Peter warn them? Because he knows that these false men will turn their hearts away from the centrality of Christ 
to focus on things of lesser importance, carrying the danger of lives that are self-gratifying and self-centered and self-inclined and and self-promoting. You know, the, the, the reality about Paul's concern for those at Colossae was, again, men who were seeking to, to somehow take the eyes and hearts of God's people off Christ as the central one. The centrality of Christ is the burden of his message to the Colossians. But it's also subtle, you see. These men are not so much denying Christ, but they are moving him from his central place. And that will lead to denial. It's so subtle, as is all false teaching. And Peter is concerned that uh, these people would be diverted and corrupted and not come to know the fullness of True saving faith. And and will you please notice, friends, we we are not talking here about recognized cults. Peter's not talking about the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons. But he's talking about those that appear as a part of the Christian fraternity. In fact, John, and we've referred to him a few times today and also as Pastor Powell in that second chapter of his first letter when he there talks about the false teachers, the false prophets, the antichrists. Notice what he says in verse 19 of that chapter. He says, they went out from us. But he says something very, very significant. He says, but they were not part of us. They were not of the same spirit as us. Oh, yes, they were among us, but they were not the same. They were false men. And there came the moment, of course, when their true nature was exposed. And John says they were antichrists. And and Peter has the same warning. There shall be false teachers among you. Among you. That reminds me of Paul when he is about to leave the believers in Ephesus. He had been three years among them. And he talks about how for three years, night and day, He ceased not to warn everyone with tears. There's passion in this man of God to see that this church is established strong. A church that's guided by the word and with men of the word. And that's why his benediction has to do with this when he he, he prays that He commends them to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. But notice what he says prior to that. To those elders, to those overseers, he says, listen, take heed to the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. To feed, to tend to the church of God. Let me pause there. Listen, to tend to them as shepherds, not CEOs, not entrepreneurs. More and more, friends, I see the church being run like a business. And business principles are coming in as being the principles upon which churches now are being built and directed. No, it must be a word-guided church with men of God who have shepherd hearts, who care for the flock of God. And so he says here, take heed, feed the church, which he has purchased. It's not your church, as we heard earlier today. It's his church. He has purchased this church with his own blood. And then Paul says, for I know this, 
after I'm out of the way, after I have departed, grievous wolves shall enter in among you, not sparing the flock. These are not shepherds now. But listen, also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Yes, among them, seemingly one of the brethren, or a number of the brethren, but <clears throat> drawing away disciples after them, ungodly men. And you see then how, how subtle such false prophets are. Coming back to Peter here, he says, who privily, who secretly, like, like, like a traitor in the camp, who privily shall bring in, that is, into the church, damnable heresies. That word privily is, is significant. It means to, to bring in alongside. These false teachers, says Peter, would teach things that were right, but so cleverly they will include with it, the false. It's, it's, it's the devil's age-old ploy. He knows he can't destroy the church from without, and so he will seek to do so from within. He tried it with Israel. And all those enemies that came against Israel, but they failed again and again. But you know, whenever the devil works from within, there are times, friends, when he has a measure of success. I'm not talking about the church of Jesus Christ, but he has some success, and people are affected by these wolves. And, and it's all so subtle. False prophets, false teachers don't come out trumpeting the fact that they have some false teaching. They're making out that what they're teaching is true. And how sad to see many sincere but gullible people taken in by the dishonesty of those who are twisting the, work of, the word of God to support their false notions. And that is why I say, friends, that if we would secure uh, our spiritual life and our growth in God then we must feed ourselves on the Word of God, and we must be, be alert to the subtle strategies of the enemy to corrupt us. Because we know that heretical teaching has been a, a prime tool of Satan to sow harmful seeds and to stifle the progress of evangelistic effort. Paul, he writes to the Corinthians, he says, we are not ignorant of his devices. God help us too, friends, never to be ignorant of the enemy's devices. Jesus gave a parable of the tares and the wheat, and it says that whilst men slept, that is, they were not watching when they should have been. The enemy took advantage and very subtly oversowed the field with tares and then went his way. And one can perhaps uh, assume that there were those who were most irresponsible who said among themselves, oh, he is all right, let him be. It's too late, friends, when the damage is done. Because we have known leaders who have said, oh, well, if they've got some false teaching, we can always just correct that after they've gone. Uh-uh. What, what folly. What folly to speak in those terms. And some of us have been condemned because we have watched our pulpit 
and not allow questionable men to stand behind the sacred desk and preach because we've not known just what they might say to affect God's people. I must admit, friends, I, I am deeply offended by those who, who charge the defenders of our faith with being divisive. I want to say this afternoon that it's the ones who bring in the destructive heresies who are dividing, not the ones who are, are resisting them in upholding the truth of God's Word. God help us. Because the seriousness of the hour is marked by the readiness on the part of many, as Peter says here, many, to follow these men and their pernicious doctrines, to, to run to the defense of these men, whatever be their teachings and the ultimate damage they cause. It's the proof of the success of such men who, as Paul's, uh, Peter says here, through covetousness will they with feigned words make merchandise of you. That is, they, they woo the people with their smooth talk. They are clever. They are easy words. And then they take advantage of them. They are prompted, Peter says, by covetousness. Two things here. Such as craves to draw followers after them. There are those who desire popular applause. That's why they always try to say what people want them to say. They're out to win people over to themselves, as we saw there at Ephesus, where Paul says, listen, they will seek to draw disciples after them. It's interesting too, is it not, that in uh, Revelation chapter 2, the first letter of our Lord is addressed to the church at Ephesus. <clears throat> and whilst they come under reproof because he says, I have this against you. You have left your first love. There are some commendations, among which is you have put to test those who say they are apostles and are not, but have found them to be liars. I'm sure that there were those who had taken heed to certain aspects of Paul's teaching. But there are those who seek to win people over to themselves, and that's why they, like their ministry, makes one feel so snugly comfortable <laughs> with these men. By covetousness, this is one side of it, that which craves to draw followers after themselves. They covet that following and that uh, allegiance, but also that insatiable, insatiable desire, Peter says, with some of these for financial gain. And I have seen men with manipulated uh, methods that were spawned in hell. For example, Selling angels. Pastor Powell and I were in a meeting in Manchester, on the air Manchester, many years ago. And this man, he was taking the scripture from Acts 10 about Cornelius. And he says, when he had prayed up and paid up, because he was a man who had given liberally in the cause of helping people. When he had prayed up and paid up, God gave him an angel. And so he had people with envelopes marked on it, angel, and putting their offering in. God help us. God help us. Charlatans. 
the, the, the reality was that we knew of, of uh, those who were so affected by such men that when they had left town, those, those men had left town with their riches, there were these simple-hearted people who had pledged heaps of money and now they went to their pastor. It was the pastor who had to clear up the mess. Going to their pastor afterwards, saying, listen, I pledged this in that emotional moment, but I, I can't afford it. I've got my little family to bring up. He says, forget it. Amen. Forget it. Right. I tell you, friends, as Peter says here, there's a judgment day coming. And for some, it'll come sooner than the ultimate judgment. So we must be able to distinguish between the true and the false, whether in men or message or manifestation. And hear me, please, for we are confronted with such peer pressure these days to conform to the judgment of others, to accept things because others do so, to go along with the crowd, even though there are people who say, well, you know, there is that little nagging thing inside that I, I wonder about. But somehow they seem to smother that and go along. I urge you this afternoon, friends, don't be afraid to examine teachings and manifestations. And don't be afraid to exercise an independent mind. Maybe your best friend or friends who are being caught up with something that you know is not right. Don't just try to keep in by agreeing with them when you know in your heart of hearts, no, this is not God. Because you see, the scriptures, they, they urge us to judge teachings, to judge these manifestations that are claimed to be from God. And there are many scriptures we could refer to with regards to prophecies. Um, in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 29, it says, let the prophets speak two or three. Let the others judge. Let them judge. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. John in his epistle, chapter 4 and verse 1, says, try the spirits to see whether they be of God. It's dangerous, friends, for us to accord uncritical acceptance of men or manifestations or teachings. For to be in default in this manner is to imperil our own spiritual lives, to retard the true work of the Holy Spirit. And inevitably, of course, it will bring dishonor to the name of Christ. We must prove all things so we might hold fast to sound doctrine and thus bring restraint on what is unsound. So what kind of test should we apply in order to determine the genuineness of what is being taught? Well, first and foremost, of course, we come back to this more sure word of prophecy. It's the test of scriptural endorsement. And this must ever be the first test. What saith the scriptures? There must be a, a, an application of the mind, a searching of the scriptures, just like the Bereans in the book of Acts. When Paul was teaching, to see whether what he was teaching could be substantiated by the Scriptures to confirm or then to reject what is judged. Nothing can ever be accepted that does not find clear endorsement of the Word of God. And will you please note this? It's, it's not simply the exercise in trying to find some single verse that appears to support the questioned teaching or manifestation. 
how often a Bible text has been quoted or misquoted to validate some position that has been nothing but other than a corruption of the Word of God. Remember a conference in uh, Melbourne back in 1972, a long time ago, but it was an issue because of many men who were going around casting demons out of everybody. Everybody had a demon. And so there was a, a special conference called uh, on the whole issue of whether born-again Christians could be demon-possessed. I remember being in that conference, and a man stood up, and he said, well, he, and he was very much for it. He was going around, and he was doing this very thing, casting demons out of people. And so he got up, and he said, well, the Scripture says, in respect of Saul in the Old Testament, that the Spirit of the Lord departed from him, and an evil spirit entered into him. So I stood up and said, Mr. Chairman, please, would our brother quote that scripture again? So he did. Got up, he said, the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit entered into him. I said, Mr. Chairman, would our brother please quote the scripture? And so he said, um, the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit entered into him. I said, Mr. Chairman, the Bible doesn't say that. It says, the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. That is entirely different. It was nothing to do with demon possession. And then another man got up and he said, well, what about Ananias and Sapphira? When Peter said to them, why have Satan filled your heart? So I got up again. <laughs> I said, Mr. Chairman, would our brother please complete the scripture? I said, in fact, I'll do it. Why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? I said, nothing to do with demon possession. It was incitation to deception. So we're just not looking for just a single verse. Rather, friends, it's, 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 it's to see what the, the general context of the Scriptures teach. How important that is. The practice must be condemned, which makes something look genuine by deceitfully applying certain scriptures in support which do not really support them. A teaching, a prophecy, a revelation must be rejected where it contradicts the general sense of the Word of God. Listen, and whoever the preacher is, however popular, however world-famous he might seem to be, we come back to the word, the most sure word of prophecy, and we judge it according to the word. There's also the test of spiritual and mutual benefit. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 3, he says, he that prophesies, speaks unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. One thing you will not have, friends, in any simple utterance of prophecy in the gathering of God's people, you will never have anything that comes from God that's condemnatory. If there's condemnation in it, you can set it aside. It's for edification, exhortation, and comfort. And, and Paul is clear that manifestations of the Holy Spirit must have certain edifying value for the whole of the congregation present. When we come together, friends, it's not to be amused. It's not to be entertained. It's to be instructed. It's to be edified. This matter of building up Jesus, building his church, and we in our local assemblies being built up strong in the Lord. 
this edifice of the local gathering of God's people under uh, the headship of Christ and by the faithful ministry of the Holy Spirit becoming strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I believe it needs to be learned again, friends, that, that personal worship in the secret place and that which takes place corporately in the church must be seen as taking different forms. You can shout your head, you can shout as much as you like in other tongues in, in the secret place. But you don't come into the house of God and do that. Oh, brother, you're not Pentecostal. Uh, I'm, I'm 200% Pentecostal. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul makes it so clear. And you'll notice the significance of his words in verses 18 and 19 when he said, I thank, I thank my God. I speak with tongues more than you all. Oh, there you are then. Everybody, let's all speak with tongues. Uh, Paul is not saying that. And we've heard it. We've been in meetings. Come on, everybody speak with tongues. Totally unscriptural. I thank my God that I speak with tongues more than you all, yet in the church I'd rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Now often have you been in a service where you've been trying to worship and you, you've been, you can't, you can't. And there's someone by you that's totally distracting you're trying to enter in, and this person and that person, they have to do all kinds of antics. <laughs> they have no consideration for the rest of the people gathered in the presence of God. Friends, when we participate in worship, whilst there is a very personal sense in which we enter in, it is not individualistic individual individualistic worship is for the closet is for the private place where I'm meeting with God morning by morning but when I come into the house of God I must be mindful of all my brothers and sisters who are being gathered together with me and ever seek that they might be edified praise the Lord so there is this spiritual, mutual benefit when we come together. This is what Paul is teaching, you see, very clearly about Pentecostal manifestations. Oh, I, if I was to be teaching in this way in some place, they say, oh, brother, you're, you're, you're quenching the spirit. He can do what he likes. Well, of course, we'll come to something else in a moment. But there is also this test of an inborn witness. And this is what we have referred to without having to amplify it now. In the first epistle of John, chapter 2 and verse 20 and 27, where John says, listen, you have an unction. The, the Greek word charisma. You have an unction from the Holy One. And you know all things. There is that inborn witness. You know, in John chapter 10, we have Jesus. It's, it's an incredible chapter. And we have Jesus in that parable of the shepherd and the sheep. And he says something so significant in verse 5. He says, a stranger will they, that is the sheep, not follow but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. Remarkable. It reveals the, the nature of the true shepherd and many aspects about the sheep. Notice that Jesus says the sheep do not hear 
the false shepherds. Verse 8, all that ever came before me, said Jesus, are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. That is, they, they are able to distinguish sounds. So they do not follow the commands of these false shepherds. Oh, yes, these who came might have been dressed like shepherds. They might have taken on the language and the demeanor of the shepherd and calling those sheep to follow them. Oh, how attractive, how persuasive. And so the, the nature of false shepherds is really vicious. And their ultimate aim is the demise of the sheep. That's why Jesus says in verse 10 of that chapter, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. That's the false shepherd. That's the false teacher. That's the false prophet. I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Thank God, friends, we have an ear for the voice of the true shepherd because we, are, we know him. Day by day, we are in his word. We, we understand what he is saying. And when anything contrary comes, we discern that. And there is also that inborn witness to what is true and what is false. So when he, our Lord, is speaking, those who are his sheep are obeying. When he is leading, we are following. When he is imparting, so we are receiving of his life. When he is protecting, there's that sense of security that we have in our blessed Lord Jesus. Oh, the need for us to walk close to him and to be filled with his Holy Spirit that we might have that little phrase we use and borrowed this morning, that we might have this instinct for truth. The Holy Spirit is a sure guide. There is an inherent knowledge. There is that, that uh, ability to discern, to detect, to discriminate between what is true and what is false. True manifestations of the Holy Spirit carry a real sense of His presence so that with the manifestation or with the teaching, with the utterance or the phenomena, there'll be no jarring of the Spirit within us. Such inborn witness ought not to be set aside. When there is that check in your spirit, follow it. Follow it. We should follow both the promptings and the prohibitings of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Stay with the check that you feel in your spirit and wait then for that fuller understanding that he will give to you. How important these things are. There is also the test of, of clearly holy and honorable motivation. All the, the, the things that Peter outlines here concerning these false prophets shows there is unholy motivation. But all the works of God primarily honor Him. Well, do we ask when we are hearing anything or observing anything, what attitudes to Christ does this teaching, do these manifestations evoke? Does it exalt Him? Does it glorify Him? Does it affirm and acknowledge his lordship? The bringing of one's life under his lordship? Oswald Chambers makes this comment. He says, my experiences are not worth anything unless they keep me at the source, Jesus Christ. If you try to dam up the Holy Spirit, with the desire of producing more inner subjective experiences, you will find that he will break the hold and take you again to the historic Christ. 
He says this, never nourish an experience which has not God as its source and faith in God as its result. If you do, your experience is anti-Christian, no matter what visions or insights you may have had. In fact, I would say this afternoon, friends, that seeking some phenomenal experience for the sake of it can be very dangerous. Dear lady in the church where I was pastoring, once said to me, uh, Pastor, have you ever gone down under the power of God? Because she'd been in meetings where there were those who were apparently slain in the spirit. And she expected me to say, oh, yes. I said, uh, no. She was kind of, uh, I don't know if perhaps the word horrified is too strong a word. But it, it did surprise her. What? You haven't been? I said, no. She said, oh, I would like to. I said, what for? And there are those friends who do seek after phenomenal experience, but that can be dangerous. Someone else has made this worthwhile comment. Sometimes Christians can take their eyes off the Lord and begin to focus on their own subjective experiences. Their goal becomes their own personal enjoyment, and their worship becomes a form of entertainment. In the end, true joy is replaced by frivolity and flippancy. He goes on to say, when our religion becomes play, we are on the verge of idolatry. It was said of the Israelites at the foot of Mount Sinai that the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. They had forgotten the awe-inspiring words that they had heard there from the mouth of God himself. Their worship became a form of play, and the next stage was demonic, and the worship of the golden calf. This man said, if, if our worship takes on the character of play, the result will be no less serious for us today. God help us. I think there's also the test of personal credibility one has to bear in mind. There's need to exercise much caution where the person who is teaching or is supposedly sharing some about some manifestation, a person who is evidently without credibility, a, a person whose moral character is questionable, a person who has a dubious record, maybe of causing division, or always giving utterances that contain unmitigated condemnation, as we've already intimated. Perhaps a person who is known to be unruly and unsubmissive. The person who is self-assertive and uses such means to promote self. With true servants of God, we... Incredible how there's been the emphasis today on aspects which we need to hear that God is saying something. This whole matter of the discipline of humility. That in all our service for Christ, it's for his sake, his namesake, for his honor, for his glory. Not for our own sake. And there is, and I, I, I bring this in because it's important, I think, the test of controlled expression. There is a questionable phenomena around today which includes the apparent dispossessing of a person's control, a loss of consciousness at certain points, taking on the, the, the appearance of hypnotic trance, 
people who allow themselves to go into some kind of stupor. You know what the Bible teaches me, and it's Paul again in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 32. He says, the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. In other words, those who are under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit are never robbed of their sensibility. They become masters of their own actions. Even where men of God were prostrated before him in some ecstatic experience like Ezekiel or Daniel or, or Paul or, or John on the Isle of Patmos, they were all so very much cognizant of what was taking place around them. And I, I don't have the time, but if you were to go into Acts chapter 10 and see Peter, they had a phenomenal experience of what is, is described as a trance, where he saw heaven opened, and he heard the Lord's voice uh, speak to him. And yet, he responded so rationally to, to, to what he was required to do. He continues to, to dialogue with the Lord. Peter is evidently very conscious of what is taking place because he then ponders over the vision. And when the Holy Spirit directed him to those who, who sought for him from the house of Cornelius, it says that then, that is immediately, Peter went down to the men and he spoke to them in full possession of his faculties. After which he went to the house of Cornelius. And then you'll notice he does not major on, his, on the phenomena, on his experience, on how this all came about. He preached a wonderful, powerful, Christ-centered gospel to him. <clears throat> Didn't go and write a book about it. <laughs> Remember when they were gathered there on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was given. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake with tongues as the Spirit gave them to, to utter. And people round about came flocking to, to observe this phenomenon. And they were saying one to another, what's all this mean? Why, we even hear people speaking in our own particular uh, language, our own dialects. And here's Peter, who had been worshiping the Lord in other tongues. He gets up, and in full control of his faculties, he says, men and brethren, listen to me. And he gives that masterly message that focused again upon Christ. Praise the Lord. These are just some of the tests by which we can come to a clear conclusion on the genuineness of what is claimed to be spoken in God's name and, and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Don't be afraid, friends, to judge. You're not judging the man in that wrong sense, but you are judging that which he claims to have received from God and what he is teaching. <clears throat> and it's not just one of these things that I've mentioned. It's an aggregate of all these things. Thank God this afternoon for the more sure word of prophecy. Fill your heart and your mind with this word. This is our safeguard. I don't know if I should be saying this, but I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> because actually I, I was particularly impressed by Bishop J.C. Ryle. Now, that goes back 125 years ago. No, I didn't hear him then. <laughs> <clears throat> but in the book that is written 
with, there is a collection of many years marvelous discourses. Warnings to the Churches is the name of the book, and if you've never seen it or you haven't got a copy, get hold of a copy. It's published by the Band of Truth Trust, but it is a marvelous book. And here was this first Bishop of Liverpool, this Anglican man, this church man. But I tell you what, he has no hesitation in saying, listen, if you are in a church where you are not being taught sound doctrine, he said, leave it and find a church where you can sit under the sound teaching of God's word. Wow. It's important, friends. It's important. It's crucial that we are building up ourselves upon our most holy faith. And that is through this mighty, majestic, glorious word of the living God. There's no substitute for this. No substitute. By the grace of God, tomorrow morning I'll just share on the word-guided Christian. We've been talking today about the church in a particular way, although it's had its personal application. But I want my life to be right. I want to please God. I want to do His will. This is where I'm going to find it. And I want Him to be glorified. Father, thank you that today we spent these hours together in worship of you. We do love you today. We honor you today. We worship you today. You are our God. You alone are our Redeemer. We have our trust in you for our salvation. And not only for that initial work of grace, but the ongoing work of grace. We are trusting ourselves to you. And thank you for your word. And thank you, Lord, that you help us from day to day to have some measure of understanding. Oh, no, Lord, we know, we know we don't have the fullness yet. We wait that coming day when the capacity to comprehend who will not have the limitations of time. We will be with you, and then we will know as we are known. Now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. But until that moment, Lord, when we see you, and we enter into the fullness of that eternal realm, which we cannot comprehend now, oh, help us that day by day we will commune with you, and we will have you speak into our hearts through your word. You'll find us as a, a people receptive and obedient. And we will be found growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name I ask it. Amen.